Welcome back to the Invest in Yourself podcast. Today I'm joined by Mafia author Frank Hade. In today's episode, we discuss his book about the Kansas City Mafia history. The name of his book is The Mafia and the Machine. I personally read this book and learned a whole lot about the Kansas City Mafia. Please subscribe to my channel for more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into Frank's story about the Kansas City Mafia. Hey Frank, how you doing, man? Doing well, Adrian. Thanks for having me. Oh yeah, well thank you for coming on, man. Taking some time out. You bet. My pleasure. Well, I really enjoyed your book, and uh, you know, like like I was telling you, that you know, there's not a whole lot known about the Kansas City Mafia. You know, we hear about the New York family, Chicago, a little bit about the Traficante, you know, but you know, it's kind of like the Cleveland Mafia and other families along those lines. So. What uh, drew you to write the book about the Kansas City Mafia? Well, uh, you know, my family goes way back in Kansas City, and um, I come from a long line of uh, Irish-American bricklayers and machine politicians in Kansas City. Going, And my, my father is uh, 96 years old. Wow. And so his memory goes back to Tom Pendergast. He remembers, you know, when Pendergast, when Tom Pendergast was alive and when Tom Pendergast was hmm. ruling Kansas City. My dad was just a, a boy at that time, but but he remembers those days. And so he used to tell me stories about those days, you know, when I was growing up in the 70s. Uh, it was always very interesting. And then, uh, you know, I just uh, became interested in local history. Um you know, that you can see behind me, I've got a portrait of Harry Truman there. It's, a, it's too far away to see it, but it's actually signed huh. my good friend, Frank R. Hayde. And that's not me. That's my grandfather. But uh, <laughs> that's I, was named, cool. I was named after my grandfather. So, uh, so, you know, between our connection to Truman and the stories that my father would tell me, I just I became interested in local history, uh, the Pendergast machine, you know, and then uh, and then later, uh, I started reading these mafia books from other cities, you know, New York, just like you mentioned, Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, etc. cetera. And, uh, you know, it was such good reading because there's so many connections and one city connects to the other. And there's this web of intrigue and complexity. And, you know, there's all I'm not interested really in typical true crime. You know, right. serial killers, uh, <laughs> you know, none of that stuff really interests me that much at all. But uh, the organized crime, the mafia stuff is, is different and it's infinitely fascinating. And um, I would agree at with some you. Point, you know, I, I asked the same question as you. I was like, well, you know, I mean, everybody in Kansas City knows that there was a, a mafia there, you know, but nobody's written about them. Right. And, uh, so I just decided I'd take a crack at it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was the, the Mafia and the Machine, yep. the story of the Kansas City mob. That was the first book about the the mob in Kansas City. There's been a couple others since then, a couple of films also. Gary's done some really great stuff, both books and films. Um, you know, but that was, my book was the first one. And it really uh, caught on quickly because there was a lot of interest in the city about that topic. Um, I would imagine because like I said, you know, there's not that organized crime aspect in, you know, Kansas city. I I'm here in Nebraska, so I'm not too far away from there. So when I heard that, I was like, wow, that that's not too far from home. And, right. you know, so for me locally, that's what, you know, caught my attention to it too, man. Cause it's like somewhere I can just drive and, you know, go sure. check out, <laughs> you know. And, you know, there was a, a connection between Kansas City, organized crime in Kansas City and organized crime in Nebraska, in, in Omaha. I remember and, hearing in your book that there yeah. was a hit that went down yeah. in Omaha. And, uh, you know, I, I can't remember what, what, what his what the situation was on that. But, yeah, it was. I don't uh, know if you recall. <laughs> you know, well, the uh, let's see, the man's name in Omaha was uh, Anthony by AZ, I think. And uh, it's been a long time ago since I wrote this book. But <laughs> yeah, Mr. By was was a big shot in Omaha and, and nationally, too. I mean, he was he was really connected because they they ran a lot of uh, bookmaking in Omaha and, and uh, they would lay uh, they would take 
big bets from other bookies in other cities. And uh, so, so they were really plugged into the national scene, even though they were a very little, small, quiet crime family. But this Baezi was apparently the head of it, like the boss or maybe, you know, one of the top two or three guys. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he, uh, a guy from KC went up there to Omaha and tried to get Baezi interested in uh, a drug deal. And Baezi got in touch with the boys in KC and says, hey, is this guy okay? And they told him he was because, you know, they knew him. He was a local criminal. And uh, and so they vouched for him. Well, it turned out that shortly before the guy had gone from KC to Omaha, he had, uh, let's see, he had, yeah, he had been busted for drugs, you know, and, and he had agreed to cooperate with hmm. the feds. Damn. And so when he was dealing with Baezi, he was already cooperating. And so they started building this case against Baezi and, and Baezi called uh, Kansas City and said, you got to take care of this. And uh, I mean, that kind of shows you how strong this little organization in Omaha was because, I mean, it, it, Casey could have just said, well, you know, sorry, forget it. You're on your own. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. No, they, they knew they had to do something about this. And so Baezi demanded that KC kill the guy, the criminal that went up there and, and got him involved in all this. Hmm. So they sent a couple of guys, uh, Felix Farina and Tiger Cartarella, who was real well known in Kansas City as a record store owner later. Um, but they shot this guy like three or four times. And he survived, but he survived. And, uh, and then he testified against them all. And Baezi went down, uh, you know, and so it was kind of a big deal. And at that time, I think it kind of really opened the door on Oma what was going on in Omaha. You know, it kind of, Cat was sort of out of the bag after this big case. Yeah. Um, and, and was that family that was, okay, so what the crew that was in Omaha, were they under a branch? Were they under the, like the KC mob? You know, I, a good question. And I don't think that anybody has really sorted that out completely. Yeah, I don't think so either. And, and improved anything one way or the other. Um, you know, but I think certainly they were very connected to Kansas City through mainly through bookmaking, but also other things. And, uh, and Baezi was also connected to Chicago. And of course, KC ultimately answered to Chicago. Yeah. Um, but the, yeah, the closest links uh, seem to be between Omaha and KC. Yeah. Uh, well, but, I think, oh, go ahead. Well, sorry. No, I was just going to say this Baezi, he had, he, he, he had connections all over New oh, York, yeah. uh, Las Vegas, you know, West Coast. So he was really, you know, plugged Connected. into the, to the <laughs> national syndicate beyond yeah. kc yeah yeah and so the first reported mob activity in kansas city i think um I, from your book it was there wasn't the earliest reference was a man being crushed in the head he, he was by a brick you know what i mean he was yeah. they beat him with a brick yeah yeah do you recall yeah. that so they they reported that in the news headlines and that's when they they kind of became aware of hey there's something there's something like a crew of guys going around it, Italian guys or something, or what, what do you think they were thinking at that point? Well, I think that the headline that you're referring to there, I think was uh, one of the very first times that the word mafia appeared in print mm -hmm. uh, in the United States. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. New Orleans, you know, had a, had a, a um, really early mafia presence. And I think that the, the word had surfaced down there first before anywhere else. And it had, it had been printed, uh, you know, down there maybe once or twice before. Mm -hmm. And then Kansas, and then that incident you're referring to in KC was, uh, you know, yeah, one of the very earliest mentions of the word mafia. So hmm. it shows you just how, um, how far back it goes in Kansas City and, you know, how um, important Kansas City is historically in the history of this phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, they. so when the, the first Italians, they came here, where where were they from? Do you do you recall from your research when they came to the Kansas City? And how uh, almost all were from Sicily. Um, mm -hmm. 
I think about 80 some odd percent of the Italians that settled in Kansas City were from Sicily. And, uh, you know, there's certain uh, towns that do, uh, you know, that were, there was high percentages, high concentrations of people from certain towns. I can't really name the town. Castel Vetrano was one of them. Uh, Campo Real mm -hmm. was one of them. Uh, Palermo. Um, but uh, yeah. So there were, you know, certain people that knew each other in these small villages, small towns, small cities mm -hmm. back in Sicily um, came over within a few years of each other and they were already connected and they knew who they could trust, who they couldn't, et cetera. So it was a fairly typical, you know, uh, very, fairly typical situation in, in the other cities at that same time with the immigration patterns and yeah, because I did an interview with uh, Gavin Schmidt. He uh, made the book, The Milwaukee Mafia. I don't yeah. know if you've heard of that one, but yeah. he told me that a lot of these families, they would come, you know, from Sicily or whatever, and uh, they would immigrate here because wherever their village was going, you know, a lot of them would end up coming together, you know, here after a few years, hey, they bring their brother and then their wife or the, you know, whatever it was. But right. that's how it seems like there's a pattern there. Yeah. So. When they first came over here, they uh, <clears throat> they did a lot of the black hand extortion. Was that their first crimes that they were involved with? Yeah, that classic, uh, you know, crime where um, the victim would receive a letter in the mail. You know, the language was sometimes very polite, um, you know, but it had that menacing black hand print or sketch of, a you know, that one of the... Uh, early letters in Kansas city that was intercepted had a black hand along with a skull and crossbones written on it. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, yeah, you didn't want to be the recipient of one of those <laughs> letters and everybody knew what the, in the, you know, in the North end, yeah. we all knew what that meant. And, uh, it was, you know, pretty crude crime, just basic straight up extortion. Yeah. Um, and then only later then did they get more sophisticated, you right. know, especially when prohibition came in. Yeah. And one instance I can recall from the book was that there was an officer's house that they had blown up. Um, officer R R R Ramio? Ramo? Riemo, I think. Yeah. Ramo, yeah. Yeah. So do you recall that? And can you expand on that? Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. Again, <laughs> it's been quite a few years since I wrote the book, but um, there was two officers really mm -hmm. uh, in Little Italy, in the North End, you know, back in the very late 19th century um maybe on into the first few years of the 20th century um that were killed by the kansas city mafia and uh Ramo was one of them um and uh yeah the um uh, I, I wish i could think of the gentleman's name he, he deserves to be remembered and, and mentioned um right they both do certainly and, and i regret that i can't uh remember his name off the top of my head but he was shotgunned you know, just a, a short distance from his house. Um, yeah, it was deadly yeah. serious. I mean, it was just. They did not care who you were, whether you were an officer yeah, or not. No. I mean, they just, you no. know, as it got further on down the line, you know, there was sort of that, you know, you can't kill a cop. I mean, right. they still probably would a little bit, but it, that died down because. You know, right. There was, there was just became a bigger deal, I suppose. But so when they came here after the you know, extortion, black hand, they, they started doing gambling brothels. And you said, uh, what was the other one? Uh, pro prohibition. When yeah, that with came liquor, out yeah. With, with yeah. prohibition. And that's of course what really catapulted the mafia all over the country, you know, into the whole new level. Um, mm -hmm. and everybody understands that, but, uh, but getting back to that, you know, viciousness, um, you know, people wonder, well, well how did this, crime family in Kansas city gets so strong and so influential, you know, for such a, you know, for a relatively small city. Right. Um, and I think that was part of it. I mean, these guys were just hardcore. They were, they were bad dudes and they really, um, really had no fear, you know, like you say, of, of whether the you know, cop or a politician, I mean, on much later decades later, they were still, you know, doing this stuff, you know, killing people in broad daylight, right in the, you know, yeah. busy, busy time right downtown, things like that, really just brazen, I guess would be the, 
the word and um they had so much political clout that they could get away with a lot of this stuff you know so with the political clout <clears throat> they had officers on their payroll and then they would help people get elected with the machine right so kind of explain what the machine is because your book's called the mafia and the machine yeah and, and thanks for asking that because that's a good question and uh, a lot of people don't understand uh, the title right away but the machine refers to a political machine it was basically a, uh, a largely uh, consisted of irish american democrats um, who assembled these urban political machines all over the country, really, in these big cities. And in Kansas City, it was especially strong. Tom Pendergast was the boss. He was never ele an elected official, never held an elected office in his in his life. But he was the behind the scenes power in the Democratic Party. And the machine operated by trading favors, uh, stealing elections, you know, through all kinds of different methods, stuff in ballot boxes, you know, ghost voters, all those classic ways. And, uh, and they were extremely corrupt. Um, and uh, in uh, the, uh, about the late twenties or so is when the mafia and the machine kind of came together. And, and how so, did uh, that form? Yeah. Well, you had uh, Tom Pendergast who was very well established by that point. <clears throat> and then you had this uh, young, Italian American named Johnny Lazia, who was uh, kind of the golden boy of the older mafioso, the guys uh, you know who had immigrated from, straight from Sicily, and the guys who had come come through the Black Hand and then started and then really got things going in Prohibition. And Lazia was sort of their golden boy, and um, he arranged to kidnap some some of Pendergast's guys, uh, and. Um, that make a long story short that kidnapping led to it could have led to a war or something like that but it didn't it actually caused the two groups to come together yeah, yeah. ain't that a weird situation right yeah so he was the first boss of the kansas city mafia i suppose Johnny uh, Lazio. Yeah. yeah he yeah. was so when they formed that relationship after uh, they kind of set everything settled down and they were able to work out an agreement and they used the mafia for the for muscle, right? To go and kind of intimidate the voters and get them to elect the right people in. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but by then, though, what you know, it wasn't really so much using the mafia because the mafia really kind of, you know, they when they pulled this scheme, this kidnapping paper, uh, it was kind of a case where Pendergast sort of uh, kind of if you can't beat them, join them, and so they joined up. But Pendergast understood that. Um, I think I'm pretty sure from the very beginning, he understood that the mafia was not going to be really subservient to him, you know, that this was a partnership. It, it, it was not, um, you know, a junior senior relationship. Right. It was a collaboration. Yeah. And um, I think Pendergast had legitimate fear of, of these guys. And um, they certainly were happy to work for him and, they made money together and you're, you're exactly right those guys were some of the ones who really helped uh swing some major elections through terror basically <laughs> i mean you know terrorizing people shooting people on election day you know and bombs blowing up and the elections i think and the political side of things are one of the things that sets kansas city apart and makes this book interesting because i don't think anywhere else did you have such a close alliance between organized crime and, and politics right and uh people talk about how important prohibition was to the mafia and it's very true it was extremely important but machine politics were really every bit as important in in um allowing the mob to uh achieve the type of power that it did yeah because power. it was able to you know, if you got, like you said, you know, you, you have the political power on your side. Say when your guys go to jail, you're going to have someone in that that office to vouch for them or, <clears throat> you know, talk to the, the judge or something to give them a light sentence. And then, yeah. hell, if they got the judges on their payroll, then, you know what, they're going to probably get a fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, whoever's being charged or, you know, yeah. on trial. But, yeah, I mean. With them <clears throat> working with that relationship, they went on for years doing that with the mafia and the machine, 
right? Yeah, it really did. I mean, it was it, it was probably probably peaked in the in the 30s when Pendergast was still alive. Um, but it did continue. You know, Pendergast's nephew started running things after Tom went to prison, and the system continued, and it, it was a pretty well oiled machine. But you know, there was prosecutions along the way, and uh, some of that power did diminish. Um, and then the mafia cleverly sort of looked beyond Kansas City, where most of the reforms had ha had happened, and mm -hmm. and started just establishing more of a power base in, in Jackson County. So you know, in, instead of looking at the police department, they would look at the sheriff's office. You know, instead of looking at the city council or the aldermen, they would look at the county commissioners. Mm -hmm. And you know, they started moving some operations into unincorporated areas and things like that. So they were able to really continue that, you know, well into this sixties and, and, you know, beyond really, I mean, even into the seventies and by then they were into, you know, some other stuff, even though their political power had waned, um, their wealth was still growing because they were in the casinos and right. things like that. But the politics really is, you know, is, is a very interesting part of the Kansas City story. And, um, you know, if you read my book, you'll see a lot of names of senators and congressmen and judges. And, uh, you know, some of them were reformers and others were on the pad, you know, yeah. but it was pretty. I mean, there was a time and this is no joke. There was a time when if you called the police station, you know, there was a real good chance that Johnny Lazio would pick up the phone. I mean, yeah, he, he kept an office there. He 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 ran the police. The, the Kansas City mob ran the police department in a major metropolitan city. You know, for quite a few years there in the 30s. That's and, insane. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, talking about Johnny, uh, how do you say it? Lazia? Lazia. Johnny yeah. Lazia. Him and Lucky Luciano were close, right? Uh, I wouldn't say they were close. I did compare the two. Okay. You book. said. They grew up together or no? No, they didn't grow up together, but they did grow up under very similar circumstances. Okay. They were That's what I thought. At the same time, immigrated about the same time, or the parents did. Lazzie was actually in Brooklyn before he was uh before he came to Kansas City when he was real young. Mm -hmm. Um and you know, there were some other parallels between their life stories uh that kind of struck me, you know, and they were both bosses of their respective cities. Yeah. And I believe they did uh, meet and interact at the 1929 Atlantic City yeah. conference. Um, I yeah, I recall that in your book. You, you yeah. mentioned that and you said that uh, uh, I, I guess they just talked and they planned or what they were going to do after Prohibition is what it was. Yeah, you know, that was one of the topics at that conference. Uh, the mm -hmm. writing was on the wall that Prohibition was going to be repealed. And, uh, of course, you know, they were so heavily invested in alcohol at that point that they knew they had to diversify if it was, uh, if the law was repealed and, and the law was repealed. But by that time they had accrued so much money and, and so much power that it really didn't affect them. In fact, some of them stayed really involved in liquor in Kansas city. That was the case. I mean, after prohibition, you know, you, if you look at all the major liquor stores in mm -hmm. Kansas City, um, the guys who had liquor distribution rights, contracts, you know, almost all mob connected. Damn. Yeah. And, you know, those stores operated for decades. I mean, I, I remember those stores in the 80s. You know, a lot of them were still run by this, those those same guys. That's yeah. insane. Well, I mean, I mean, you, it still goes on today, but just on a different, you know, on a quiet level because <clears throat> you still see, I mean, it's weird, but I see like pictures of, you know, mob guys today and they're, they're owning their own businesses, taking pictures and stuff. And, yeah. you yeah. know, but I, I don't think they, they, I don't know that I don't, they probably have it where it's where you can't do a hit anymore or something. Cause right there's not that going on anymore. So, yeah, but the businesses, they're, they're still going on and whatever they are that they make money legally and illegally, I think, because there's no way to escape taxes or you got to have some kind of major front. <laughs> I think, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of these, these men did 
get involved in legitimate businesses that uh, have flourished, you know, on their own. I mean, stuff that's not related to to the vices, you know, or the right. rackets, really. Um, you know, a lot of uh, blue collar businesses like uh, salvage yards, um, you know, heavy equipment. I mean, in KC, you know, back in the day, they were involved in, you know, taxi cabs and oh gosh you know liquor um all the all the adult stuff that's the strip clubs you know that was all mob run in kansas city they, they had a monopoly on on that adult entertainment um, well up into the 90s um mm -hmm. so yeah yeah and you know they're adaptable they've always been very adaptable and uh, yeah. And it is a business. The organized crime is big business, right? <laughs> yeah, because after Prohibition was gambling, I know Johnny was involved with it, Lazia, right? He was in it for a, a while. And then, I mean, he, he was very powerful, you know, at the time. And he, uh, I think other criminals that weren't even part of the KC mob were kicking up money to him just out of respect, because if they didn't, then they were going to have problems, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's another interesting element that I think sets Kansas City apart and makes the book interesting. You know, um, Kansas City was the one place where the fortunes of the mafia and those those rural desperado outlaw types like Pretty Boy Floyd and Dillinger and the Bonnie and Clyde types, mm -hmm. you know, their fortunes really came together and and it blew up, you know, in, in Kansas City in the 30s with the Union Station Massacre. And that, that gets back to just what you were saying, how Lazio was... He had so much power that, yeah, if you were just a, a local hood without any connections, but you were, you know, let's say a semi-professional burglar, you know, you're probably going to be kicking something up. At least you better be. <laughs> and even if you were an out of town, if you were well -known, you know, a well-known professional, a professional criminal from out of town and you were coming into KC to, to do business or to just to hide out for a while uh, and it was well known as a hideout. Um, you know, then you better uh, pay tribute to Lazia. Yeah, absolutely. And so without going into all the details of the Union Station Massacre, we can't do that. It's such a long and convoluted story. It's all in the book. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I show my book real quick? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, so there we go. This is this is it right here. There it is. See if I can get it on camera. The Mafia there Machine, the story of the Kansas City Mob. Thank yeah. you, Adrian. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, but it explains the whole, uh, how this whole Union Station massacre went down. And it was a combination of the mafia and these rural outlaws. And that really gave birth to the modern FBI also, that whole incident. So it had tremendous ramifications that, la you know, historical uh, ramifications that we still, you know, still feel today. I mean, that's what, that incident is is what um, spawned the FBI to start uh, have their agents start carrying guns. Because <laughs> up to that point, they didn't even carry guns. They were really seen just strictly as you know behind the scenes investigators. Huh. But, uh, yeah, so they weren't even stressed. Master, that, that that's what changed all that. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So after uh, <clears throat> you know Lazia, he was murdered. What what happened with that? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, it, it was 1934 and, um, it was, uh, there's different theories, um, and different suspects and, uh, nobody was ever really, uh, brought to justice, at least not, um, civilian justice or legitimate justice right. for that. <laughs> Crime. Street justice, I suppose. Murder my camera. There we go. I uh, now some I, some guys might have got killed, you know, uh, by the mafia, and you know they were they were looking at several different people. Joe Lusco was a kind of a rival of of Lazia's within Kansas City at the time. There was factions within the family back then, and and later too, um, especially in the seventies. But uh, and you know there was. There was just so much going on at that time. Um, and there was so many people who were so ambitious. And back then, you know, um, taking out uh, taking out a boss was 
probably um, probably happened more often yeah, and was yeah. a little bit more a little bit more um, expected or understood than later when it became more like when they when they had consolidated their power more and there wasn't as much as many factions anymore you know mm -hmm. where if you were a boss you could basically you know rest easy and know that you know it was going to be a very rare thing if if someone tried to kill you but back then Lazia probably knew that his chances of getting killed were pretty high um mm -hmm. yeah yeah so, no i mean oh were you gonna keep going on that or uh well only to say <laughs> that yeah he, he was shot down by a tommy gun you know mm -hmm. uh, classic you know crime from that era typical gangland hit you know he pulled up uh to his uh his apartment late at night with charlie carollo was driving and charlie carollo was basically his number two guy and he took over after Lazzie was killed uh, and Lazzie's wife was in the car too right there with him but he stepped out first and brrr, they, they gunned him down and um Damn. his funeral i think was uh, the largest ever in Kansas City. I think to this day, I, I don't think there's ever been anything quite like it. It was an enormous event. I mean, you know, just tens of thousands of people, you know, filling the streets um, outside of the church over there in Holy Rosary Church in the North End and typical celebrity. He was a, what I would call Kansas City celebrity gangster. Yeah, you know. he, he was loved by the yeah. political side, you know, the mafia guys, and then anyone else that he served in that town. You know, I'm sure, like you said, he was a celebrity in that town. because he was, Yeah, and he was the type that would, you know, turkeys at Thanksgiving, you know, soup kitchens. <laughs> for the poor. Yeah. I mean, the the uh, everybody knew him. He used, he used to walk around downtown and shake hands and chat people up, you know, and give, give some money to, to, to the, you know, indigent folks, you know, and just, uh, he was, he was a man about town for, he was not behind the scenes, you know, secretive kind of guy. He was right out front. Yeah. Well, that back then I'm sure you could be because hell there was no cameras or surveillance and stuff like that. But I mean, you seen when John Gotti tried to do it during the, yeah. During his era, I mean, it was all caught on camera and stuff. But yeah, and I think of Gotti as kind of a throwback to those guys, yeah. to like Al Capone, John yeah. Lazia. You know, right. that's yeah, he admired that. You know, and yeah, when he came along, everybody was like, you know, wow, this guy, you know, is exactly what you know we think of when we think of a gangster. You know, yeah, um, <laughs> that's true. Now, guys like Nick Savilla in Kansas city, not so much, you know, you look at his, he, people just thought of him as an old man, you know, that, I mean, you'd look at him and be like, what, he's a gangster. You know, <laughs> maybe if you saw him in the, you know, his younger days, but even then not really, cause he never wore flashy clothes really or any of that stuff, you know, just very secretive he, behind the scenes kind of guy. He was the boss. I'd say he was the last known boss of that KC mafia. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah, I would say that, you know, um, he's probably even more so than Lazia, really. He, he's the one, you know, associate. You, you could call the Kansas City's family, the Savella family. He is because he ruled for a long time. You know, he he really took over um, in the late 50s when his predecessor, Tony Gizzo, died. Mm -hmm. And Tony Gizzo had kind of brought Nick along as a driver. Um, and then, uh, after Gizzo died, you know, that was about the time when uh, Sevilla showed up at Appalachian with Joe Filardo, who was one of the older guys from KC. Um, it's always been really hard to say definitively in some cases who the boss was, who the underboss was, you know, the lines get a little blurry, but Joe Filardo was considered a boss and he took Nick Sevilla to Appalachian. And Sevilla was about 45 at that time in 1957. And so he took over and in the 60s and the 70s. Damn. And then up into the 80s, he he was the man. Yeah. yeah I'm, you brought up the Appalachian meeting. Appalachian, I don't know. Everybody says it different. Yeah, right? yeah, right. I'm not <laughs> sure. They, they, Appalachian, they, I think, is, is correct. They, they were busted in a taxi too, right? Nick and yeah, Nick yeah. Richard. Nick Nick Sevilla did not uh, run through the woods like you know, like so Everyone. many of those other guys did. He, he yeah. was in a taxi cab, and somehow the police intercepted the cab. Yeah, and they got them both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they didn't really. I 
can't remember if they got arrested uh, or not, but um, yeah. but they went on. The important, the, what mattered was that it was documented. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So then after that, he had, I don't know, like you said, 30 plus years reign as right. a mobster and becoming the boss. And, uh, you know, he, he was morally or mostly involved with, uh, you know, Vegas. I mean, that's what he's known for is like the whole right. Vegas sk skimming and stuff and making money out there. Right. And then they were caught. <clears throat> I think they were someone was caught on a wiretap talking about the skimming. I don't know if it was Nick, maybe, but that's kind of how the they had it documented. Yeah, because he was given yeah. four years in prison for it. Uh, well, Nick actually never went to prison for the skim. Um, oh, OK, he went to pr he got uh, so. Um, he went down on gambling charges and it stemmed from when the Chiefs. Kansas City Chiefs played the Minnesota Vikings in, in Super Bowl II. Oh. And uh, they were taking so many bets in Kansas City, you know, and at that time, uh, the FBI had gotten some wiretaps uh, into in the social club where Nick Savella, uh, you know, operated out of in the North End. Mm -hmm. And so they put together a case, uh, a gambling case against Nick Savella back in like 72. But Oscar Goodman, his lawyer, who, as you probably know, later became the mayor of Las Vegas, right. kind of a legendary figure himself. Yeah. Uh, he uh, kept Nick out of prison for like a decade, um, just with continuances and, you know, all kinds of legal maneuverings. But then he finally went to, uh, to prison um, right about the same time that the FBI was catching up with the skim that was going on in Vegas, which was, you know, a, I mean, Nick Savella was a key figure in the skim. He was, um, you know, through his connections with the Teamsters Union and his control, basically, of the head of the Teamsters Union, Roy Williams, who was, you know, succeeded uh, – Jimmy Hoffa and, and Frank Fitzsimmons, Roy Williams was the top guy in the Teamsters Union. And that's when the Teamsters Union had a ton of members and a ton of power. And Roy Williams answered to Nick Savilla. So that that's, you know, Nick Savilla had just a tremendous amount of power nationally. Hmm. And other my other crime families, you know, had a tremendous amount of respect for Nick Savilla. Uh, Chicago did, you know, uh, certainly. Uh, Chicago outfit, I think, yeah. thought of thought of Nick Savella almost as as one of their own because when Nick was young, younger, he actually almost got killed in a drive by shooting. He was sitting in a car. This is back in the forties, and he was sitting mm -hmm. in a car with a, a deputy sheriff. And they these gangsters came along and unloaded with machine guns and uh, shot up the car and. Savella survived. Uh, he, did, he didn't even get hit, but the deputy sheriff got shot and ki got killed. Damn. And so after that, uh, Savella ran. He, he went to Chicago just to get away because right. things were too hot in KC for him. So he went to Chicago and he met a lot of the outfit guys at that time. Yeah. He, he went to work for him, basically, and he got real close with some of the really important outfit guys. Um, and he, yeah, he he maintained that relationship for the rest of his life. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, you went there and form, met all them guys, and I'm sure that helped the Kansas City Mafia and the Chicago outfit work together and do stuff together. But yeah. I think ev eventually <clears throat> he did die. Oh, I know he died, but uh, he, <clears throat> I think he was still trying to get out of prison, or they let him out because early because he was having some bad health issues and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, yeah, they did let him out on a compassionate release, and then he he died in 1983. Mm -hmm. Nick Savella did. Um, he was about 70 years old at the time. Um, but his brother Carl was still alive, and his nephew Tony was still alive, and those guys were still running the family. Um, so it was still the Savella family running things after Nick died. So do you think? What do you think they got going on now? Do you think they're completely gone? Uh, well, um, I am writing another book right now that 
in a oh, way. Yeah. It, it's not it's not a sequel to the Mafia and the Machine, mm-hmm. um, but it it does push the story forward into the nineties. Okay. Because all the other treatments of, of this story, like the Mafia and the Machine, tip basically ends in the in the eighties with the the skim that we've been talking about, Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. The casinos, the, the mob taking money out of the casinos, taking that money back to Kansas City, back to Chicago, Milwaukee, Cleveland. Um, this was a huge case. And the movie Casino was made about the case. Um, so after all that, um, it was never the same. The leadership went down. And then, um, you know, the power and the influence was just not there anymore. Um Law enforcement technology had a lot to do with it too. And um, these days, you know, with cameras everywhere and you know other things, it's just harder to get away with stuff too. So, yeah. um, but there was still a lot going on in the '90s that I think is very interesting. And I've I've just finished a new book. Um, it'll be coming out later this summer. And it uh, this is the fact. This is the first anybody's ever heard of it. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about it because uh, um, I'll just be honest with you, Adrian. I, I, you know, I promised Gary Jenkins to be the first, uh, the first real um, oh, okay. interview on this book. Okay. You know, because he helped me with the book, so I owe it to him. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I respect that, man. I understand. But I'll just mention it here, and this is the first, first public mention of it. So it'll, it's basically about some very interesting elements of organized crime in Kansas city in the 1990s. But then getting back to your question, what's going on now in this century, you know, I think of the mafia largely as a 20th century phenomenon in America. <laughs> and um, it's amazing that the Casey family uh, was able to um, survive after the straw man, Las Vegas casino sting. Um, yeah. And it's even more surprising that they survived into the 21st century, but they did. And they stayed involved with adult entertainment. They stayed involved with bookmaking, um, fencing stolen goods. These were some of the things that they were still heavily involved in. Um, You know, just about, oh, I guess about 10 years ago now, um, there was a big case out of Kansas City, a big internet gambling uh, ring run out of KC by the guys with the same last names as their dads and uncles and yeah. grandparents, you know um Keeping yeah the tradition going <laughs> yeah they, they kept it going and they adapted to the modern era and they were doing this offshore internet gambling stuff and they um they got caught that was only about 10 years ago you know it was white collar stuff nobody got killed or roughed up as far as i know um in that whole thing but was that like the last reported crime then? Yeah. Then? Yeah. I, there, well, <laughs> there was an arson um, about that same time, maybe a little bit later, mm-hmm. um, a real old school thing where, uh, you know, a couple of the, a couple of the well-known guys with well-known names um, burnt down a, a very iconic business in yes. Kansas city it was typical, you know, insurance scam. Thing yeah. going on, um, but they got caught and um, didn't, work out. didn't work out very well <laughs> for them. Uh, but it was like, wow, these guys are still doing that old school street level stuff, you know, to this day. Yeah. That was that really came as a surprise, I think. Yeah, because after yeah. my book, this was after my book had come out, oh. you know. What year did it come out? Your, your first book, uh, this book came out in, in 2007. Oh wow! So yeah, it has been quite a few, quite yeah. a few years since you made it. So I mean, yeah. So I guess all the questions I'm asking you are fresh in my head, but for you, right. shoot, it's been almost yeah. 15 years or something. Yeah, man. no, it, it's been a long time now. But the good news there is it's still in print. Uh, it's still, yeah. it's still easy to get on Amazon or anywhere yeah. really, <laughs> um, and uh, it's still, you know, just as intriguing as it was the day it was published i mean you cannot make this stuff up right no not it's, at all man these stories are just so fascinating you know i mean a lot You're of right. people who read this book just told me about how they their eyes were 
you know. Holy crap. <laughs> like, wow, this happened here in KC? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because some of the like, younger people my age, you know, I'm in my early 50s. And oh, I'm 23. For us, our memories, we go back to the 70s, so we can remember that they had a very powerful presence there in the 70s. But that's about yeah. all we knew. We didn't really know much. Of, we knew Nick Savella's name. But right. out beyond that, we didn't know any other names. Um, you know, uh, so anybody younger than me really – you know, didn't really have much of a recollection. Well, you got a whole book for the whole for everybody now. <laughs> right. So I really opened it up to a new uh younger generation who wanted to, you know, learn about this. And they were very surprised that this was that this stuff had happened in Kansas City. Because yeah. a lot of this was really big stuff with national, you know, repercussions. Officials and everything. Yeah. And then now the older people, um, you know, they I mean people of like of my dad's generation or even even younger than my dad people in their 70s 80s you know they they all practically have everybody in Kansas City probably practically has some kind of story of when they you know something happened and this guy was involved and because it's a fairly small city and so and they were so mob was so powerful there that they intersected with so many elements of city life you know if you were a restaurateur or if you were a truck driver, or if you were a taxi driver, or if you were a barmaid, or a stripper, or you know, an insurance salesman, or a politician, or just about anybody, you probably had some kind of dealing with these with guys <laughs> somewhere along the way. They had their ways, man. I yeah. mean, especially yeah, being in a small town. So, well, uh, just want to thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Want to encourage anybody. Uh, to read the book, The Mafia and the Machine, The Story of the Kansas City Mob. Uh, it's, like I said, easily available. And uh, I, I'm sure you won't regret it. It's a really uh, entertaining and fascinating story. And it connects to a lot of other places, Chicago, Las Vegas, New York. You know, you can go on and on. Um, but yeah, I think I said it in the somewhere in the book in the back back cover blurb or something that uh, the story of the american mafia is not complete without a chapter on kansas city and, no, that's, uh, oh, i ahead. think that's true and so you can you can get the whole story pretty much there's always more to the story right right <laughs> it's an epic story i could have kept writing this book forever and made it 500 pages with you know tons of footnotes but yeah. um but it's a it's a you know it hits all the uh, major events and um it's a very entertaining read. So thanks, Adrian. Appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Thank you again so much for coming on, man. Yeah, maybe we can do it again. Oh, absolutely. We will. And, you know, All once right. you get that that second book out, you know, then we could start talking more about that and I'll read it. <laughs> Great. Great. It is absolutely insane to think that there was a mafia family in Kansas City. Gary Jenkins from Gangland Wire Podcast took me on a mob tour in Kansas City. If you haven't seen those videos of that tour, please go to my page and go to the playlist and you'll see a Kansas City Mafia Tour playlist. Gary took us all around. Gary is also Frank's friend. So I hope you enjoyed this. They all kind of connect and it's really interesting to hear about this history and about the Kansas City Mafia. Frank is a very good author and a speaker. His book, The Mafia and the Machine, will be in the video description. I highly recommend this book to anyone who enjoys history about the mafia. Please subscribe to my channel for more interviews like this. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Also, please be sure to comment any key takeaways that you got from this video. There will also be a playlist at the end of this video of all my other mafia-related videos. The last thing that I'll bring up is my other podcast I co-host with Salvatore Polisi, who was a Colombo mobster. The name of that podcast as a lifetime of mafia tales i know if you enjoyed today's video you'll enjoy that one so please check it out it's all on the same youtube channel all you got to do is go to the page and check it out it's in the playlist and you'll see all of our videos thank you again so much for watching and of course we'll see you on the next one